Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm. This is obviously a, a really important topic for us as we um, have been looking at the design and launch of, of what you all are aware, the major initiative on food security under um, U.S. foreign assistance. Um, and it's particularly important because one of the very explicit um, assumptions that underlines the U.S. strategy for food security is that driving economic growth through agriculture really will be uh, reliant upon uh, leveraging private sector investment. So the role of the private sector is really central to the U.S. vision for food security as the driver of, of engagement in the ag sector and in particular to get the economic growth um, that is in our mind the real route to, to um, addressing food security. So what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about some of the experiences that we have in supporting public-private partnerships, particularly around the technology arena, not um, trying to cover broadly all of our investments in public-private partners, but focus on the development, delivery, um, and application around technology. And to talk about some of those experiences that we've had in various different tools that we've been able to bring to bear um, from that experience. In, in essence, I think the role of the U.S. government has been largely around two aspects of why we've used public-private partnerships. Uh, one is clearly to invest in development and delivery of technology where the market isn't there for the private sector to, to do this on their own. So where there are market failures or inadequate size of markets, um, the U.S. government has played a, a role in, in ensuring that technology still, that technology from the private sector that has application to the small-scale farmers that are our constituency does still um, move forward. And then secondly, to, to reduce the risks that the private sector face in going into underdeveloped markets in, in particular. So around the area of technology development, we've worked with the private sector under a number of different uh, modalities, specifically looking at how to take access to access technology that exists in the private sector, apply it potentially in different crops or in some of the crops that the private sector is engaged with but don't see um, necessarily near-term commercial markets. So one of the, the means of doing this, as was discussed already on the panel, is around the donation or licensing of technology, where really the private sector has had a fairly small role to play, but instead is making technology available to public institutions um, to further uh, undertake the research and development of those technologies for application in Africa. And a really Im uh, important tool that we have supported in this, in this realm has been the establishment of an organization called the African Agricultural Technology Foundation. And I highlight that because it came into being explicitly out of conversations with the private sector, mostly multinational corporations about how to improve the transfer of technology. How do we get more technology going for application in Africa? And one of the really important, uh, or one of the barriers that the private sector identified was the potential liability associated with licensing technology, particularly around GM technology, genetically modified crops, but also other technologies um, where companies were concerned that in trying to do the right thing, they may put themselves at risk. Um, um, from liability concerns. So the AATF, as it's known, was explicitly designed to be a legal entity that could hold licenses from the private sector and make those technologies available in a way that protected, um, protected companies for, from um, liability concerns. And they also, the, the goal of the AATF was to, to ensure that there was stewardship of that technology as it was developed and deployed, sort of ensuring that research went beyond uh, proof of concept, as people would call it in the private sector, but really went beyond that into the actual deployment of technology. And I'll come back to that because I think that's a really important area where partnering with the private sector has been um, uh, very important in helping us understand that it goes beyond that making technology um, deliver on the ground for producers, small-scale producers in Africa, it takes more than just funding research. It really takes the deployment of that technology. And that's an area where the private sector um, is strong and where the public sector is not necessarily um, quite as strong. 
a specific example of a project we have funded where industry has really just donated or licensed technology has been the development of insect resistant cow pea. This is a genetically engineered or genetically modified cow pea variety that has a BT gene that's been licensed from the Monsanto Corporation for public sector partners to further develop and deploy that in uh, cow peas for Africa and has involved a, a significant network of both international and African research institutions to deploy that technology. Taking a step um, further in terms of engagement, we have examples where industry is really co-developing technology with public sector partners and that the um, role of the United States has been to provide support for industry to engage in those collaborative uh, relationships. An example of that that we're currently supporting is around development of nitrogen use efficient rice for West Africa. This is a small biotech company in California called Arcadia Biosciences that has a technology whereby a, a GM crops require only one-third the amount of nitrogen fertilizer to get the same yield. So if you think about this in, in the context in developing countries where fertilizer is obviously a key constraint, it's a high cost, or, or the delivery systems aren't there, nitrogen use efficient rice can help us circumvent some of those um, infrastructure challenges around fertilizer. So here the company is actually actively engaged in the research process, further development of that technology with African public sector partners. And, and our, our support is um, going to both the company and the African partners. Increasingly, we're also looking at how is it that we can better incentivize industry to develop and deploy technology either faster or to a broader collection of farmers, not relying on the actual transfer of that technology to the, to the public sector, but instead trying to make those market opportunities um, grow for the private sector to invest. Um, and I will talk about some tools that we are doing that, but, but one example specifically where we're, we're focused on the technology development piece of that is, is actually not yet in Africa, but working with two companies around development of um, what we call abiotic stress tolerant rice and wheat. This is working at looking at traits like drought tolerance and heat tolerance in rice and wheat for South Asia. We we're funding a U.S. company, again this Arcadia Biosciences, and an Indian company to work together to, to develop and deploy these technologies in South Asia. Here again, we're, uh, the U.S. role has been to accelerate the deployment of that technology in a country that, that um, the U.S. corporation might not otherwise look at, but also to, to work with these two companies to broaden the delivery of that technology to, a, to farmers that they might not normally target. So really looking at um, broadening the delivery mechanisms. And again, I, as I mentioned, I think this is, this is, is as important in terms of thinking about public-private partnerships as the previous two examples or modes in which we work. Because what industry really brings to bear in the technology arena not only is you know, some good science, but also the ability to, to develop and deploy technology. R&D, uh, often the D part gets underplayed within the public sector because it's not what the reward systems for our U.S. universities and even uh, national and international research institutions. So really go transferring between a, a technology research project and um, delivery of a commercial product, even if it's free and done through the public sector, a real product to the farmers, is something that industry excels at. And that's an area I think that our own agency has learned a lot from working with the private sector, is to focus more on the product delivery side of things. Um, and to really try to work with our partners to help them understand what a product development pathway looks like. Um, and I think that's an ongoing challenge that we look forward to, to working with our private sector partners. Amit Roy talked about uh, the Virtual um, Fertilizer Development Research Center, which is something that we're supporting to both um, to gain sort of a critical mass of research both within the public and the private sector on development of a new generation of fertilizer technologies. So I think that's an example, again, where, where public funding can help spur innovation in both the public and the private sectors. In this case, we don't have a very direct role in the, the research itself. 
I think there was also on the last panel some very important discussions around the, um, how we can improve the delivery of, of new technologies. Certainly I think some of our work um, as well as others around the development of input industries, the seeds and fertilizer industries, um, the work of AGRA, for example, and the agro dealer networks, programs such as that we support called the West Africa Seed Alliance, which is is um, working on the dealer networks, but also in strengthening the seed companies themselves, training in, um, in good business practices, for example. Those are really critical if we're going to take technology out of the public sector or, frankly, from licenses from, from um, uh, larger corporations that work in this arena. Those, those local companies are essential to the delivery of technology, and I, I was happy to hear there was a really good discussion about that piece of it. The public extension obviously is a very big part of that as well and I think that's an area that we're just starting to look back, um, to look into again and sort of understand where is it that we can make some investments in um, extension services um, that go beyond just public extension but also tackle some of the, the hard questions around public extension. I would also highlight what I think is an area that we, we need to do more of because this is very catalytic to, to both the development and delivery of, of new technology, particularly from the private sector, and that is around regulatory reform and development. Um, seed laws, fertilizer laws, um, and biosafety laws in particular have very significant impacts on the transaction costs that companies face in trying to introduce new technologies. <coughs> Particularly in a place like Africa where you have very small markets, this become, if each country has its own regulatory procedures, um, it becomes a very significant transaction cost that in fact reduces the market size for industry. They're not going to go into three or four countries that may be neighboring and do the exact same regulatory packages all over again. And so getting harmonization of regulations, streamlining regulations so they make good scientific sense but don't... Um, hinder private sector uh, investment is a key and very scalable investment that the public sector can make. And it's an area where I think we have a comparative advantage, um, one government talking to another about how we can help governments um, in this arena. I just point to some specific examples around the area of biotech regulations or biosafety regulations. Um, we've been very actively, as I've already mentioned, in development of, of um, GM crops with African and other countries. But I think probably from the private sector's vantage, probably the most catalytic investments we've made have been in around helping put in place regulatory systems, working directly with governments. For example, Burkina Faso, which is now commercially growing biotech cotton, our investment was not at all in the technology. It was helping the government of Burkina Faso put in place the regulatory systems to train their regulators to be able to implement them um, with all caution, uh, with all the appropriate cautions. Similarly, in Kenya and Uganda, our work around development of regulatory systems has allowed companies to come in to test cotton and maize um, as commercial products in those countries as well. Um, so I think that's an area where we will, we will be um, continuing to play um, an important role in moving technology from the private sector. Lastly, I thought I'd talk a little bit an, about an area, again, where I think that, that there will be growing opportunity for the U.S. to move technology um, forward, both in terms of helping farmers, but also in helping the industries that surround um, the agriculture sector. And that is the area of financing. Clearly, for at the farm level, um, the adoption of technology is is linked up with the ability of farmers to to purchase improved inputs, um, to take the risks associated with adoption of new technology they may not have a high level of um, confidence in, and so I think we're increasingly looking at ways in which we can. Um, use finance as a tool for um, helping farmers adopt technology at higher rates. Vouchers uh, and, and subsidies for, um, vouchers as a form of subsidy for um, accessing improved seeds or fertilizer is a controversial topic, obviously. One we've, uh, at AID, also have some fairly strong opinions about. But I think there's still a lot of room for innovation in looking at how do we target vouchers as a transitionary tool um, to help small-scale farmers take the risks associated with adopting technologies that may dramatically enhance productivity, but may also have risks associated with that. 
So a couple of uh, innovative things that we're doing in this arena, um, we're looking, we've funded a pilot with CIMIT, the International Maize and Wheat Center in Kenya, to look at how would we target vouchers for um, purchasing commercial seed, uh, maize seed, hybrid maize seed. And our motivation for doing this was that uh, Kenya is currently testing a biotech variety of maize that's insect resistant. And that maize variety will only be introduced in hybrids. So the question is, how can we expand use of hybrids in a way that makes this technology available to farmers who don't currently purchase hybrid seeds? And in fact, looking at how you can use vouchers to segment the market very, very um, specifically to allow more farmers through the use of vouchers to gain access to this technology. And I think the, the, the jury is still out in terms of how, how the... Um, how vouchers can best target the, um, the population of farmers that we're aiming at and not necessarily displace um, existing commercial markets. Perhaps uh, more importantly, I think uh, some innovative work that we're doing with IFDC and one of our land-grant university pro projects is looking at linking input subsidies to saving programs. So very specifically looking at the question of how do you transition out of input subsidies? How do you get farmers to take that hopefully added productivity boost that they get from use of improved technology, in this case fertilizers, they make more money. How do you get them to uh, save and invest that money so that they're not dependent on vouchers in future years? And I think that's the kind of um, targeted use of vouchers that I think we look to, to play a role in moving forward. We're also very um, engaged in expanding our um, work around the innovation associated with use of weather indexed insurance as a tool to help farmers manage some of the risks. Anyone who works in ag research knows that more marginal farmers, smaller scale poor farmers, are often very technology averse because they need to manage risk over the long haul, risks associated with bad weather conditions in particular. If the rains don't come at the right season, they'd rather have a maize variety that maybe doesn't yield as much, but that weathers the drought a little bit better. And we know this from a lot of years of research. Um, so using, to developing uh, weather indexed insurance tools that target smaller scale poor farmers. We have uh, two pilots going, one in Peru and one with pastoralist livestock producers in Kenya, in uh, northern Kenya. Here the public investment has around uh, the insurance tool has been in supporting feasibility studies, early product design, collection of the weather data upon which the in insurance is um, indexed, as well as, very importantly, the training and outreach to producers so that they can understand what an insurance uh, product is. It's, it's actually pretty um, unintuitive when you stop to think about it, that you're going to buy something that you might not get a return for from uh, return from that purchase for, for several years that you've been paying for it. I think we all know that when we sign off our uh, car insurance and start to wonder why we're paying for that all the time. Um, so that's what the public investment has been around. The actual insurance tools themselves is purely from the private sector. Um, local insurance and financial institutions actually involved in the marketing and the production of the insurance. Um, and international reinsurers have transferred some of the risk away from those smaller um, national companies um, that has been important to getting uh, local insurers involved. Um, already, um, in the case of northern Kenya, it's, it looks like it's a significant excess, uh, success. The, the demand for the insurance product exceeded the original pilot, and industry has gone on to expand their investment in this area without additional investment on our part. So I think that's a, an important area where we, again, can take some of the risk off of industry from, from um, developing and employing, deploying new technologies in uncertain markets. Looking up the sort of agricultural value, value chain at the food processing um, arena, again, I think finance is an area that, um, that will play a significant role in um, helping smaller and medium enterprises in African in Africa invest in technology and the infrastructure necessary to address post-harvest loss or food processing or even marketing. We have a couple of, of new activities in this area, um, both of which rely on, on a significant tool the U.S. government has available to it called the Development Credit Authority. This is, allows us to basically assume some of the risks associated with guaranteeing loans. 
Um, and as many of you know, in the agriculture sector, um, lending is significantly less than in other sectors, and it's a, a significant barrier to development of industries um, in this arena. So we have a new African uh, Agricultural Enterprise Fund that we have been pulling together with other foundations, Gates and Rockefeller, with J.P. Morgan, uh, the, and the Global Impact Investment Network. Um, we anticipate providing $16 million of debt guarantee to this fund through our Development Credit Authority and hope that that will mobilize an expected $165 million of private sector financing. So for a relatively small investment on our part, we hope to catalyze significant private sector investment that will be particularly important, again, to developing the industries um, around agricultural um, uh, like things like grain storage, transport, processing, um, and some of the market infrastructure as well. We also are, on a smaller scale, uh, working with Root Capital under our Development Credit Authority to invest in small, smaller and medium scale enterprises, probably smaller industries than under the Enterprise Fund, specifically around the ag sector as well. So I think that's uh, in the area of financing, I think that's an area where increasingly we will look to using leverage um, U.S. expertise and uh, tools such as the Development Credit Authority. And lastly, I would just mention this because it came up in the last panel. We're also increasingly looking at how we can invest in the agricultural um, and food processing industries in ways that have explicit benefits to nutritional outcomes, thinking beyond sort of the economic growth component of agriculture and looking at nutrition. We just recently signed a memorandum of agreement with General Mills Corporation actually financed through our PEPFAR program, the HIV AIDS initiative, uh, with, um, between USAID and General Mills around um, providing technical assistance to uh, medium, small and medium enterprises in Africa to develop nutritionally enhanced food products, in this case biscuits. And I think we're looking to, to do more of that type of um, activity working with a broader uh, range of both um, U.S. and international-based um, food corporations, as well as working directly with African corporations around development of specific um, food products that, that address nutritional deficiencies. So it's another example. With that, maybe I will open it up for questions. Yep. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your comments.